prayer trifecta. We humans love to pray. We pray during good times. We pray during bad times. We just love it. We're praying fools. We're praying, we're prayer warriors. We pray for our needs. We pray for other people's needs. We take comfort that someone or something bigger than us is watching out for us, which makes us thankful. Prayer seems to be built in to humanity. Here's a little sort of poem I made up this morning. We pray for desired parking spots. We pray for this darn pain to stop. We pray for ours and others' health. We pray for new and nonstop wealth. We pray to help our favorite team. We pray to reach our massive dream. We pray for the ones we love to love, and we pray to thank the one above. We pray for many sorts of things because we know our prayers have wings. <laughs> you know, some, some pray with grand and showy religious rituals. We've all seen it. They're kneeling down, they're standing up, they're laying down, their hands are going up, their hands are together, whatever. And other people just keep it simple. They keep it real. Some pray out loud, and some people prefer to keep it private. And there's, there's not a culture or belief system on earth that doesn't have prayer, that doesn't utilize prayer. I don't care what religion. All of them pray to something. If you boil down all prayers, they typically revolve around three somethings. Three somethings. One, I need help with something. Two, someone else needs help with something. And three, we're just thankful to God for something. And pretty much all prayers will fit into one of those three. And those are what I call the prayer trifecta. Now in this teaching, we're going we're gonna to hit the trifecta within the trifecta. And then at one point, we're going to hit the prayer trifecta within the prayer trifecta within the prayer trifecta. So it's a really cool section we're going to go into. Um, but before we get into that, I'm just going to read you 1 Timothy 1-2 uh, from The Voice. And it says, so first and foremost, I urge God's people to pray. They should make their request, petitions, and thanksgivings on behalf of all humanity. Make your request, your petitions, and thanksgivings on behalf of all humanity. That's the same thing. I need it for me, I want it for you, and I'm thankful to God. And that's a perfect prayer trifecta right there. Uh, a, a trifecta is correctly picking the top three winners. That's what a trifecta is. And, you know, in that we are a species that loves to pray and be prayed for, let's pray to win. If God's already supplied it, and we find ourselves praying for the same thing over and over and over every single day, then somehow we're not getting our prayers answered. See, let's master the art of prayer by picking our winners. And we're going to learn a lesson by Jesus Christ on how to pray and the attitude with which we pray. See, one prayer is for me, another prayer is for others, and finally we thank God. That's the perfect prayer trifecta. So a little history on prayer. If prayer is simply talking to God, then a conversation with, with God would be a prayer, right? You know, prayer should turn into, prayer should ultimately turn into a relationship, a communication, a fellowship, a communion, you know, with the Creator. I mean, wouldn't, it, wouldn't if you knew you had perfect connection and communion with the person, the, the being that created this whole thing, would that give you a sense of, of power? And, and being and purpose? Well, we are. See, the per first prayer in the Bible was for self. And we talked about this last week. Adam responded to God's, Where are you, Adam? Or, What path in life have you desired to take, Adam? And Adam said, I was afraid. That's the first prayer. I'm afraid. I don't know what path to take. I need help. 
And the last prayer in the Bible was, was for others. And the aged apostle John, one of Jesus' most trusted men, he was pushing 100 by the time he wrote the book of Revelation. And he had, he had just seen in his mind's eye, in his heart, uh, and, he, he, and in a sense he lived through the incredible revelation of the book of Revelation. It was so clear, so vivid, so amazing, it was as if he was actually there. He probably could even see himself at that, at that day and time. And the Lord Jesus had just told him that he's coming back. And the final prayer in the Bible is, come back soon. Revelation 22. Come back soon. That's the final, that's the final prayer in the Bible. So it's, I'm afraid to come back soon. You know, and we're still waiting for that, that return of Christ. So now prayer persistence. And we're going to see how Jesus taught prayer. And watch for the prayer trifecta. This, this trio of, of amazing things. Jesus was totally into prayer because he was totally into God, totally into helping others, and he totally knew God took care of him. You know, so go to Luke chapter 11. Go to Luke chapter 11, and uh, we're going to start in v verse 1. And I'm going to read this from the voice. Now, you got to remember, Jesus was perfect. He was perfect in every single way. Yet, he was a prayer animal. He was totally into it. So, here it is, verse 1. Another time Jesus was praying. And when he had finished, one of his disciples approached him. Now, he must have been off by himself a little ways praying, getting some me and God time. And probably the only time, that was probably the only time that his disciples ever left him alone. They were a chatty bunch, those <laughs> disciples. And uh, um, so now the disciple says, Teacher, would you teach us your way of prayer? John taught his disciples his way of prayer, and we're hoping you'll do the same. No pressure, Jesus. But a lot of us have been following been followers of your cousin, John the Baptist. And we left him to follow you. In fact, he suggested that we leave him and follow you. He spent his whole life getting ready for you. And so here we are. Now, John had a style of prayer. And it was so different than the religious leaders. And we like it. He taught us how to do that stuff. But now we see that you're getting some crazy results that we never saw with John. We want to know more about your style of prayer, Jesus. How about you teaching us your way of praying? Jesus said, okay. <laughs> Sit down. And just so you know, there's no record of John the Baptist ever praying in the Bible. But it ha he had to have had a style or they wouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. And so his, his prayer style must have been notable. It must have had, had, had panicky or flair. You know, it must, have had, uh, it must have connected with people. John's prayer must have gotten results as well. So when you need help, who do you go to to pray for you, typically? Do you go to somebody you know loves you? Yes. Typically, right? Ideally. Um, do you go to somebody who you know is going to remember to pray for you? If you ask them, you ever had somebody ask you to pray for them and, and then they call you up and they go, thank you for praying while I was in that surgery. And you go, oh. <laughs> you go, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, well, there's some people who never do that. They remember all the time. I think of my wife is like that. You ask her to pray, she will pray. Until you tell her to stop. It's like calling off the dogs. The dogs of prayer. You see? And, and, and you, also, you also know somebody has a proven track record of prayer and even getting results from prayer. Wouldn't that be somebody you want to go to? That's how Jesus was. He's a prayer animal. See, these, these disciples were no different. They wanted to learn to pray like the promised one. 
They wanted to learn to meditate like the Messiah. They wanted to learn to kill it in prayer like the Christ. Their problems would be iced if they could pray like the Christ. You know, and so, so we, want, we, want, we want to go to somebody like that. And they knew Jesus was getting stuff done. And he's going to teach them something here. Now we're going to, to add to this record, we have to go to a parallel record, and it's in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be back in Luke 11, and, we're, and uh, we're going to come back to Luke in a few minutes, and we're going to learn this unforgettable lesson on what Jesus said about the energy that it's going to take to get our prayers answered. So a lot of times people think, I was looking this up on the internet, on why people pray. And there was some nasty stuff in there. Ah, oh, because they're weak. They're weak people. You know, they're, I mean, it was just, it was stuff that I was like, golly, you know, if, if prayer really worked, then what happened to all those millions of, of, of Jews who got, who got slaughtered, you know, during World War II? And if it was really in the tsunami, and they went on and on, if prayer really worked. And, and I thought, holy moly. See, if prayer is just talk, if it's just air coming out of our mouth or just thoughts sifting through our head, that's not what we're going to learn today. Prayer isn't prayer, prayer here. This trifecta is an active prayer style. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. It'll make a lot of sense, but we have to, we have to go to Matthew first. And this is what, this is about, this is going to talk about the energy that Jesus said it's going to take to get our prayers answered. So Matthew 6, we're going to read 15 through 13, and I'm going to read it from the message. Pray with simplicity. Uh, verse 5. Matthew 6, verse 5. Okay. And, and when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, uh, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense His grace. I love how they phrased it, just be there. Just be present when you pray. You know, never waste your time on mindless and memorized prayers. Be, be present and learn to shift your full attention from you to the Father, from you to the Creator. Put your full attention to the one you expect to answer your prayers. If we're just praying because, it, because it's a, a good thing to do and with our, our spouse or our friend or whomever we're doing it with, and we do the same stuff all the time, what's that about? That's not what we're going to learn here today. you got to be present. got to be into it. See, that's the point that you're going to begin to sense God openly rewarding you, is how King James terms it. If you can be present in your prayers you're going to begin to see God openly rewarding you. Now, verse 7 now. The world is so full of so-called prayer warriors who are, are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques, forgetting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, loving you, you can pray very simply like this. Now we're going to go back to Luke chapter 9. And uh, see, God is everywhere present. We know that, right? God inhabits or he lives in eternity. He's right now, this second, watching over your birth, watching over your parents' birth. At the same time, he's enjoying you in your eternity. Thousands and thousands of years from now, it's in Isaiah 57, 15, God has a thousand years to help you with your today, 2 Peter 3, 2, a thousand years to accomplish what you need today. You're, you were loved before the foundation of the world, and you were chosen before the foundation of the world. That's John 17, 24, and Ephesians 1, 4. 
loved before the foundation of the world, chosen before that time. Our rich and loving God promises to supply all our need, all our demands, all our prayers, Philippians 4.19. You know, any temptation you face will be nothing new, but God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can handle. But he always provides a way of escape so that you will be able to endure and keep moving forward. 1 Corinthians 10.13 from The Voice. See, prayer is the world's greatest wireless connection. Mm -hmm. Unknown. You know, God knows better than us what we need. Can you envision it? Can you envision him really supplying what you need? Do you notice his unlimited supply? That should be at the top of our mind. You are the richest of the richest of the rich kids. But we just gets trained out of us. It gets condemned out of us, feared out of us. Like Adam, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. First prayer. Are you afraid? Are you, are you afraid really to, to, to put God out there on a limb and demand it and expect it and to know? You know, do you believe it? See, the entire universe was created just for you, just for us. How big is it? It's enormous. Last week, they just discovered another pl planet they think is outside even the ring of Pluto that might be as big as Neptune. They've never noticed before. They, they can't see it, but they know it's there because of, because of math. I mean, all these years. Two, a few years ago, they told, said Pluto was no, not, no longer a planet. You know, it's a dwarf planet. Now they're saying this thing's another, a, a real planet, but it's way out there. It takes like 30,000 years to go to, to make one revolution around the sun. It's so far out there. But still held within the gravitation of our solar system. Crazy stuff. And that's nothing. That's just our little piece of this solar system. What will God do for you? The whole thing is designed to help us, to build us up, to bless us, to heal, to prosper. And the whole design of the world is to tear that out and to make us our own supply. Make us feel stupid for trusting in an invisible God. But we know better. You know, the entire universe was created for us and is filled with God. And the earth is manned by ministering spirits and amazing people who are also here to help us have our need met. There's a lot of people out there, and their function is to help you, and yours is to help them. Isn't that the point of a networking group? Sure. Isn't that what the point of a family is? Sometimes you don't, might not like that family member, but you still love them. See, God made you to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Keep your eyes open, author unknown. God made you to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Keep your eyes open. You know, I think of, I think of uh, just ways how God's taken care of me. Some of these you've heard before, but you know, I'm, I remember working under a car one day when I lived in a western state, headed on four jack stands. And I was under it working, working on some, something, and, and I heard this voice. There's nobody around, but I heard this voice uh, say, roll out. And so I just, I obeyed. I just rolled sideways out from under the car. And the second I got out there, the, the jack stands crumpled, and the whole car just fell straight to the ground. It would have crushed me. <coughs> That's an answer to prayer. We ask God to take care of us. I didn't need healing, you know. I just needed information. <laughs> Don't want that kind of healing. My dad had to help a guy, a car fell on one time. And it hurt him pretty bad, you know. Um, you know, I remember uh, I asked God one time uh, when I was with a, uh, a ministry that was on an outreach program and 
And uh, I said, and I remember praying this, and I said, God, send me anywhere except New Jersey. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I just absolutely did not. I was a Texas boy. I did not. I said, because I, I knew a girl who just come back from a program from there, and, and all I heard was horror stories for a year. And so I said, God, send me anywhere except New Jersey. And then when I opened my little letter where I was going, where do you think it was? New Jersey. New Jersey. But it turned out to be the greatest thing. I met my wife of 37 years there. I mean, I, and my son was born there. I mean, it was, it's incredible. Sometimes we don't even know we're the right thing to pray for. Like that one song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. You see? I mean, so it works a lot of ways. God knows best. He knows you better than you know yourself. If we can just realize his reality. Back to Luke 11. Now, Jesus is going to give us an example of how he prays. And he points out, and, and, and he points out what we may need to include in our prayers. And I'm going to read this. This is all from the voice again. So we're going back. Remember, Jesus said, verse 2, here's how to pray. Here's an example. And see if you can, if in here you can pick out the, tri, the prayer trifecta. Something for me, something for you, and something for God. The three somethings. Father in heaven, may your name be revered. May your kingdom come. May your will be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the food we need for tomorrow, and forgive us our wrongs, for we forgive those who wrong us, and lead us away from temptation, and save us from the evil one. Did you notice the prayer trifecta in there? May your name be revered. Isn't that giving something back to God? Yeah. How about give us the food we need, and lead us away from temptation. Keep us from the evil one. Who's that for? ourselves that's something for me you know and then forgiving those who wronged us and I thought about this that's something for others but it's also something for us forgiveness is a gift as a two-way gift it's a gift you give that you get more from than the giver than you, the person you gave it to forgiveness is a gift that gives twice and that's all in that in that prayer now I know we a lot of times we hear that the Lord's Prayer and we used to, when I played football, before a game, we'd all take our helmet off and kneel down, and, and everybody would say that thing together, just memorized, and, you know, and, and uh, there wasn't much to it. But that's, what we, that's all we knew then. But, and Jesus is saying, he, he's just saying, here's a, here's a way to do it. And he hits those three points. Here's something for me, here's something for you, here's something for God. Something, something, something. A little something, something, something. Now we're going to read about the prayer trifecta within the prayer trifecta. And now we're going to get into the meat of this story. And he's going to hit something that no one had ever taught before, ever. Jesus is going to tell a story that not only shows the heart of God, but a story that shows us what we need to do and how we need to act if we actually want our prayers answered. How many of you would like to have more prayers answered? Okay, five of you. You know, I mean, if you think about it, <laughs> if you think about it, um, what I'm going to tell you is if you listen to what I'm going to teach, about to teach, I guarantee you're going to start getting more prayers answered. I can guarantee it because it's a promise from the Word. How would you like to get more of your prayers answered? Now, we all would like to say we get them all answered. I always get them, but you don't. Or you wouldn't pray for the same thing every day or every week. Okay, we're going into bonus round here. You know, this is more than anyone on earth had ever been taught when it comes to getting results from prayer. The old disciples of John the baptizer were about to get an earful of evidence are earful ear of excellent advice, should I say, about prayer. 
This is your three horses. They're running down the stretch. Clop, clop, clop. They're moving. They're flying down that, that, that main stretch. They're out front. They're neck and neck. The crowd's on their feet. They're cheering. They're anticipating their horses winning. It's a trifecta. You picked them right, folks. If you understand and emulate the lesson in this prayer example, you'll receive a lot more of, from your prayers than you ever had before. You're going to experience more victories than you ever have before. This is the lesson Jesus was trying to teach these guys. You've seen them pray in the temple. It's just memorized stuff. You saw what John the Baptist did. He was good. He was great. But we're going to take it to a whole new level, folks. Now we're not just praying and expecting God to do everything. Now we're putting something back on you. Now I'm putting something back on you. Here's what you need to do. Okay, we know we got a little something for you, a little something for them, and a little something, something for God. But now we're talking about what you need to do. And, and in here we're going to enter the mind of God from a human perspective. From a perspective he knew these John the Baptizer's buddies how they would think, and how most people think about God. And the house here that we're going to talk about represents God. And the man inside that house is the prayer procurement center, or the supply center of God, or the, uh, what is that word, the quartermaster of God. And, uh, and so just think, so when we start reading this, Think this house, this is how people think of God. And, uh, and, but this is how you can break through that thought process. So verse 5, imagine that one of your friends comes over at midnight. He bangs on the door and shouts, friend, friend, will you lend me three loaves of bread? A friend of mine just showed up unexpectedly from a journey, and I don't have anything to feed him. Now, we all know you don't need to knock, and you, God never goes to sleep. But this is, just the, this is how he has to, this is an example Jesus uses so that people can understand the work it's going to take to get your own prayers answered at times. I remember when I lived in Japan, we visited a Shinto shrine. Shinto is like a Japanese version of Buddhism. And good people. But when we walked into this beautifully ornate building, red and gold leaf and just gorgeous, um, the person in front of us, a Japanese person, grabbed this big, thick rope, red rope with a knot at the end, and went, bong, bong, and pulled that, and this, this big brass bell just bonged. And I remember asking uh, somebody who spoke English, a guide who was with us, why do they do that? And they said, to wake up the gods. Mm. And you ever seen, you ever seen uh, Japanese or certain Buddhists, or they clap their hands loud? They're waking up their god. That's, that's, what, that's, that's, their, that's what they're doing. So it's, it's sort of a, it, it's hard for us to understand. Uh, but... And, and the Shintos, they don't pray. They pray for things that most people would call insignificant. It's usually stuff that they need. A little bit of something for me. And that's typically the prayers. Maybe something for somebody else. But it's not like praying to the God of eternity like we think. Um, so enough on that, on ringing the bell, clapping hands. But this example here, it's not to teach you that that you got to wake God up. It's, it's, it's to teach us in terms we can understand how much we need to push in order to get certain prayers answered. Now, sometimes prayers get answered that you didn't even pray for. God supplies things sometimes that you didn't even know you needed. Like my wife. You see? I like to think it was God supplying. <laughs> and, uh... Whatever. And, uh, so... Now you picture yourself, picture yourself inside your house in your mind right now, or your apartment. You're asleep. And your whole family's asleep. 
Your doorbell startles you awake. You ever been woken up in the middle of the night by a doorbell? You don't really want to go answer that door typically. Um, you think, who the heck is that? You might use other, other expletives. And, uh, and especially if they just keep pounding and pounding and pounding and yelling. And then you hear that, then you finally recognize that voice that it's one of your friends. And you go, oh, oh, come on. You know, <laughs> I'm sleeping in here. But he just keeps banging. Now, this is a simplistic image of how people think of God. But it's also a simplistic message on how we can, we can get what we came for in prayer. How to get what you came for in prayer. So there's going to be three lessons here. You know, we just, God's your friend. Remember, a friend came to the door. Friends inside that house. Be specific and be bold. Be bold as heck. It's a, it's a prayer trifecta within a prayer trifecta within a prayer trifecta here. And the three loaves of bread are three round loaves, sort of like pita bread, like you might have seen, but a little fatter, maybe as, as thick as your finger. And it's about the size of a, of a plate. So they weren't little loaves. It's, it's a lot of food. And typically a woman or a child would eat one of those a day because the bread was just a, a common part of life. When they fed the, all those 5,000 people, it was, those, it was that, that kind of bread. They just break off a piece, break off a piece, and hand those out. And people might not eat it in one sitting. But a, a woman or a child would eat one. A guy who worked super hard in the fields, he'd probably eat two of those a day. Just needed the, the carbs, needed the sustenance. And, um, and the Eastern custom at that time was um, that three loaves were always given to a guest. A guest deserves abundance. Now, I was thinking, expect abundance. You might just get it. Totally expect that abundance. You might just get it. How would you like to finally start getting those prayers answered? I know you would. Always give more than, what, than what's expected. Give more than even what's needed to people. God does. Exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Is that more? That's more than you can even imagine. That's more than you can pray for. It's, it's pressed down, shaken together, running over. It's just falling out. God wants to load you down with blessings, it says in the Old Testament. It said he pursues you to, to, put, to give you blessings. I mean, that's how it's supposed to be. Always give more than what's expected. God does. Be an imitator of God. It, it, are we asked to do that? Give more. Do a better job. Don't they teach you that? If you're, especially in service work. What, what is that? Uh, under promise, over perform. Well, do that in your prayer. Do it, in, do it in your dealings with everybody. You know, do more than you said you're going to do. You know, also note that this man at the door is doing something for someone else. He's not getting those three loaves for himself. He's, he's, gonna, he's pushing like crazy to get something for someone else. And that's how we should be when people ask us to pray, too. Should go over the top in doing what we can to help them believe. Isn't that believing together? Joint heirs kind of thing? You know, isn't, isn't that a type of prayer? Intercession? Intercession. Little for me, little for you. That's intercession. You know, in fact, he's pushing hard to take care of another to get answer to somebody else's prayer. Now, this is the example we're getting to now. So this guy in the house represents man's perception to God, the giver. The guy who's inside, behind the door. Verse 7. Would you shout out from your bed? I'm already in bed, and so are the kids. I already locked the door. I can't be bothered. Is that what you'd do? You ever feel like you're bothering God, asking the same thing over and over? 
I'm sure I'm the only one who ever thought that. You see, you know, what about, what about uh, God may be too busy for you? Or what if that guy had said something a little cross to his friend earlier that day, and now he's coming to that door again? I mean, he may think twice about going to the door, right? But he doesn't here. You hang around somebody long enough, they're going to burn you. It's just the way life is. It happens. Usually the people closest to you can hurt you the most. Friends, family, workmates. Unfortunately, it happens. And you live through it. You just keep going. You keep giving. You keep moving. You keep grooving. Nothing stops you from getting what you want. Never give up. If you feel like God can't be bothered, that he's too busy for you, or you're like, you've been too bad, you've been a naughty boy or a naughty girl, it's time to push even harder to get what you know you need. Because that's some of the tricks that the enemy uses to stop us from getting the abundance God's promised us. Does that make sense? Think condemnation stops people? Sin consciousness? Guilt? Fear? Unworthiness? This guy went to the door, and, this, and, and then the guy inside was blowing him off. I already locked the door. I ain't getting up. My whole family's asleep. Shut up. Imagine if God talked to you like that. <laughs> but that's how people think of God, that, that it's, it's hard to get to and all that. So if, you, if you're going to make it hard, then work hard. Work harder. Verse See, verse 8, see, now Jesus narrates the outcome to bring home the point of how to pray. Verse 8, you know this as well as I do. Even if you didn't care that this fellow was your friend, if he keeps knocking long enough, you'll get up and give him whatever he needs simply because of his brash persistence. I love that term, brash persistence. King James calls it importunity. But hardly anybody knows what that means. Overly persistent asking. Or very persistent asking. Importunity. Brash persistence. Even if you had no intention of getting out of bed, if, and you, if you recognize that voice, and I guarantee God recognizes your voice, that you would get out of bed and you're going to give that person what they need if no other reason because they're brashly persistent. Friendship gains you access, but brash persistence gets you what you want. Friendship opens, friendship opens the door. We want to be friends with God, but if you want something, because of our human nature, we have to push like crazy. You know, this guy just keeps knocking and talking, knocking and talking, knocking and talking. And he will not give up until he gets the three loaves he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that his friend has in his kitchen. He also knows that if he keeps knocking long enough and hard enough, his friend is going to get up and give him the bread. If for nothing else, to shut him up. Now, just think about that. Just keep, just, just pray so much. Just keep knocking, keep pursuing, keep asking until God just goes, okay, okay, and opens the doors and hands you what you want. Would you be happy? Yes! It's brash persistence, folks. That's the lesson here. Part of the lesson. Keep pushing until you get what you came for. Never quit on your prayers. God never quits on you. Never quit on God. Verse 9. Jesus is still talking. So listen. Keep on asking, and you will receive. Keep on seeking. And you will find, keep on knocking, and the door will be open for you. All who keep asking will receive. All who keep seeking will find, and doors will open to, to those who keep knocking. 
See, Jesus taught a lesson on the energy output that it takes at times to get our prayers answered. It's not just talk, folks. It's doing whatever you can within your power to, to try to get that prayer answered. You pray for more money, then find a way to go make more money. Do something. You need health? Try to find a way. You still keep going to God, but you do your part. A lot of people give up on that stuff. You know, you, whatever you need. You want a friend? Then be more friendly. Try to make friends. You want a better person to work with? You need a new employee, a new employer? Figure it out. Push, 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 knock, seek, ask. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. That's a trifecta, the prayer trifecta. You know, that's the trifecta within the trifecta. Remember, it's something for me, something for you, something a little bit for God. Then another thing is, know he's your friend. You know, those other, a couple other things I mentioned there earlier. And, and then finally here, it's, it's, it's you, you keep asking, you keep knocking, you keep seeking. You see, Jesus taught a lesson on that energy output. See, the supply door is open to those who keep asking. The doors to what you need will open as you keep seeking. You'll find the doors. And then you just keep knocking. If you, just, if you don't seem to be getting anywhere, you keep it up. You keep pushing. You keep pushing. You keep pushing until you get what you want. You have to be a participant in your own prayers. And I know, I know people don't like to hear that. It's, that's what Jesus is trying to teach them. Here's a different way to pray. Instead of just praying these memorized prayers, get out there and get busy. Try to answer your own prayers while God's answering them. He'll direct you. He'll guide you. He'll lead you. He'll throw the stuff down. But a lot of times, unless we're moving, we're not going to see anything. We're not going to see the open doors. So again, here are the keys Jesus taught these new disciples about getting their prayers answered. One, ask or pray, which is pray to the Father like you would ask your best friend for something. Be persistent, be confident, and be aggressive. So ask, pray. That's number one. Number two is seek. And you could even say plan would be seeking, planning, goal setting. Plan to the best of your ability how you can acquire that exact item. You do the best you can. You do everything you can with as much energy as you have. Like that guy knew exactly who to go to. You need something, figure it out. It doesn't just always magically happen. It's not always roll out. I mean, God, God will supply, but we have to do our part too. Um, you know, like that guy knew exactly where to go. He planned out his strategy to get the bread. Okay, I need, I got, somebody showed up at my house. I don't have any bread. You know, my cupboard's bare. I know that Joe over there in that big old house, I smelled his wife cooking the bread, you know, out on their, uh, on their out of doors little oven. You know, and, and I'll bet they had some extra loaves in there. So knock, 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 midnight. He's doing this to help somebody else who had a need. And he just kept pushing and talking and pushing and talking and pushing and talking until he got what he wanted. So you keep seeking. He planned out his strategy to get the bread. See, so he could have just sat there and prayed. But Jesus said, you got to do something. You want something, do something. Don't you have to for your paycheck? You got to do something to get something. Think a prayer like that. Go to the house. You got to seek. You got to go for it to enjoy that journey. And number three, keep knocking. You have your plan. You're heading in the right direction. Now do something about it. Don't stop until you get what you want. Keep knocking. See, we are a culmination of our prayers and actions. We pray, we plan, and we do. We ask, 
we seek and we keep on knocking. If you boil down, boil all your prayers down, they typically revolve around three somethings. I need something. Someone else needs help with something. Or we're just thankful to God for something. Something, something, something. That's, a, that's part of the whole trifecta of prayer there. Ask, seek, knock, and you never stop. That is prayer trifecta. And so enjoy all those answered prayers. I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing about some things happening. God bless you all.